Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we'll be uh, chatting with learning during the pandemic, on, la- on learning during the pandemic, with uh, Randy Weingartner, president of the American Federation of Teachers, Kyle Zimmer, president and CEO, and co-founder of First Book, and Richard Barth, CEO of the KIPP Foundation. Uh, Kylie, we've been uh, t- chatting for a good number of years, and it's wonderful to see you back. And Richard, we've intersected during uh, during the last years. Kylie, let's start with you. Could you talk a little bit about what you've experienced during this time and, and what the organization has experienced and also your constituents? Because it's been really tough on children. It, it has indeed. And, you know, I, I want to start off, first of all, by just saying thanks for doing this, Mark. It's, uh, it's a a wonderful service uh, to the whole sector uh, of the, you know, of social entrepreneurs and others working in the nonprofit arena. Uh, So thank you for for that. Um, I I also wanna mention just right out of the gate, the dedication of school teachers, school staff and and the unions. Uh, Their dedication has been on really full display during the, the full run of this crisis. They've been heroes during this period and, and we feel you know, really honored to serve them. Um, First Book's role during the pandemic has really been uh, very much uh, part and parcel of what we do in ordinary times. Uh, we're a nonprofit, we're a social enterprise and we support educators and practitioners serving kids in need ages zero to 18. We work with Randy and her team over at uh, AFT, and we work with the NEA, and we also work with a huge range of daycares and after schools and preschools and homeless shelters and really anywhere that's serving children in need. Right now, we've, we've aggregated an online community of more than half a million educa- of these educators uh, in our network. And, and to show you uh, a sense of the need we're seeing, that's growing by about a thousand people a week. And our, our mission is to further educational equity uh, for all kids uh, who are in living in poverty. And we do that by listening to the educators and then creating solutions to what they need. You know, everything from affordable, high quality, diverse books to basic need, needs items like hygiene kits and winter coats to now a growing range of uh, expert informed resources. And I'll give you just a couple of quick examples that are specific to COVID. Uh, We learned through our survey work, through our our research arm called First Book Research and Insights, that 40% of the kids that our network were serving uh, had either no devices or no connectivity. So we worked with Intel and CDW and Lego, and we got computers to about 51 school districts and, and connectivity grants as well. Uh, we learned that you know books were the number one issue that people were coming to us with, and you know we we really raced day and night, and the publishers came stepped in like the heroes that they have been, and uh, we got about 14 million books out during this uh, during this period, and and right this second we're working with several uh, healthcare providers to develop messaging to increase trust and decrease misinformation about the vaccine. So we really have tried to respond as nimbly as we can, but of course the, it's been a fire hose of issues, right? And, and the, the really important point that you're getting across here is that education is about so much more than what transpires within a particular classroom. As important as that is, that's a component. Right. We're talking about national strength. We're talking about national health. We're talking about positioning um, people to make a contribution and also us all to be able to exploit their contribution as they, as they grow up. Right? We're talking about vaccinations. We're talking about fighting disinformation. So this is a much larger, you know, this whole idea that teachers belong in their little bucket right? and schools belong in their little bucket 
and books are about what happens at the moment you read them. That idea needs to be combated and it's become very clear in this pandemic that this is, we are part of the all hands that are on deck, aren't we, Richard? We are, and um, you know, it was just a little under a year ago and, and uh, it's hard to even think in those terms, but that this thing arrived, um, this, this global pandemic arrived and um, staff across the country, teachers, school leaders, health workers, um, had to pivot overnight into, you know, the unknown world. And so if you said like, what's our reality been? Uh, you know, a little under a year ago, school as we know it came to an end. Um, for KIPP, we have um, uh, 255 schools. We're educating 113,000 children every day and we have 32,000 alums. So we can talk about it both K-12 and, and higher ed. For our schools, they became food distribution centers like schools across the country who deliver two, 2 million meals because the base requirements for families had to be met first. And that goes to your issue of like, it's, it's not just what's happening in one classroom. Um, for our kids, um, we today, only there are only 13 districts in the country that serve more low-income children than KIPP does. And food was the first thing we had to take care of because we knew we were delivering food to children every day. And then we had to make sure they had materials, just like Kaiser, books, materials um, that they could work on at home. And, and we discovered, I think, uh, Mark, I'll just share quickly a few things over the following weeks and months after it hit. Um, we discovered one, we weren't one-to-one. -one. We thought we were actually pretty close to one-to-one. -one. We weren't, we thought we were. Um, we discovered that devices that we were counting on as being able to, to deliver for kids weren't able to deliver remote instruction once we, we handed them out. We discovered um, obviously many kids like we heard here have devices, but not access to the, the Wi-Fi that they needed. And we discovered many kids had a device, but now it had to be shared among three or four people in their family. All of that um, we hadn't fully appreciated. And so we then discovered also that in the world we're in, procurement was gonna be a massive challenge. Cause even if you, if you wanted devices, there was gonna be a rush to get them. So we, we had to rate, we spent $14 million in a matter of weeks to get, to make sure we had um, 70,000 70, new devices purchased. So we could start this year one-to-one. -one. And, I, and I can't emphasize enough, the difference between truly one-to-one -one and not is massive. So if you're a teacher or a leader or a family, it's like, if you're 70% one-to-one, you're like, oh, you're getting close. You're not, because now here you're, you're, you're starting your day and it's like, okay, I've got four kids who don't have a device and I've got 17 kids who do. And you're, you gotta be, you have to know everyone's gonna have a device, it's gonna be working. And, and um, I'm not gonna have to, to deal with that. Well, that meant not just you had to get technology, we learned we had to make sure we were able to provide tech support. We had schools, I mean, when we opened school this year, 400 uh, customer service tickets in week one, um, just in Massachusetts. And we worked through them in two days where we had to go home to homes to make sure families understood how to set the computer up, how to get the technology working. We did that. So it's not just purchasing, it's actually tech support. And, and, and if you look at if you look at Randy's <laughs> membership, right? I mean, the thing that I, Randy, the thing that I that has burned me for so long is I have felt that that teachers, school districts have been be, have been told for the longest time when when you talk about these issues, the equivalent of for teachers, shut up and dribble, right? Stay in your lane. Stop talking about these things like food and nourishment and 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 what, what Richard's talking about, right? And it's become clear that that is just not an option. You cannot educate young people if you don't have supplies, if you don't have support, if you don't have technology, <laughs> if you're not thinking about all these different aspects, right? Exactly right. And, and, and part of this, so first off, thank you. I'm so honored to be with Richard and Kyle and I overheard Kyle talk about, you know, our partnerships and as you see, books are, our thing here. Um, and I'm actually in my office today and I'm trying to once a week, you know, get down to Washington from New York and actually work out of my office. And I'm actually finding that very nourishing to, you know, have some semblance of, of normalcy. But the point that you just made, Mark, is that we got to give up the ghost and think that we are only, you know, about instructing in math and in, and, and English. And, and that is the way you create opportunity and justice. First off, science and social studies, I think that, that this year has proven this, 
are probably both as important, if not more, and, and um, will be ways that we can actually excite and encourage our kids to be the kind of civic participants um, and the, the ways of, of, of changing the world. And science, science, evidence, right? Social studies, civic engagement, understanding the context of what America is. And, and so English and math and thinking about it, not just as this is a skill I need for a job, but thinking about it as these are skills we need for life. But then you layer on top of that, the whole notion of um, who schools are, what Richard just said about schools. Um, Kyle worked with me and she's done such an incredible job on trying to get books to kids in homeless shelters this year to try and create some sense of normalcy in the absence of social interaction. The community schools that we had this year ended up helping families you know, where you couldn't stand up the, you know, the, the food programs like KIPP was able to do or LA was able to do. So, so, you know, there's a whole, we have to think about as we come out of this pandemic, which I hope we will do with the vaccines and with a new administration, we have to think about schools as community foundations. And that, you know, instead of digital remote being, this is what's gonna supplant, it's how do you use it to help um, create more security and more opportunity? How do we have wraparound services around schools? How do we have the food programs? What are we gonna do this summer as mm -hmm. a, like a second, I call it a second, second semester not just on um, remediation, that, and, and, and I hate the word learning loss. How do we actually help kids get their mojo back? So, yeah. so we have to kind of flip this around. I mean, both Kyle and, and Richard kind of took my words about how teachers and administrators have kind of turned themselves into a pretzel to try to deal with a pandemic, which frankly, before this new administration, no guidance, all things being downplayed, political issues, you know, in their face. Mm -hmm. and, and, and then now trying to figure out how to have schools be safe enough to, you know, create the safety so right. that they're not going to die when they know full well that it's really important to have in-school learning. You know, your point about schools are essential national infrastructure. Correct. That's right. It's our roads, it's our electrical grid, right? And, and the wonderful thing about, about having each of you is that you're part of that infrastructure, right? They're complementary elements, right? Randy, you're not doing what Kylie is doing. Kylie, you're not doing what Kip is doing, what Richard's doing with his team, right? Mm -hmm. And you've got these different approaches and there is not a one size fits all. That's not the choice. The choice is not between one size fits all and not doing it, right? The choice is how do you create a number of different solutions for a number of different problems, thinking always of the child, right? right. So right. when you look at this going forward, because we really do have to have but, a conversation. But, but, about, but let me yeah. just actually say, but it's not, I mean, market-based solutions can be helpful in terms of entrepreneurial innovation, things like that. But it is like roads, like mm -hmm. Social Security. There is a government function where government is not a bad word, but we do need government to have an infrastructure in fighting a virus. We need government to have an infrastructure in national security. We need government to have an infrastructure in helping to create opportunity for our kids. And, and I think both Richard and I have kind of gotten uh, gray enough. I happen to cover my gray, but we've gotten gray <laughs> enough to, um, to know that this, these, these fights about that, of, about um, having public schools, traditional public schools and charters compete with one another, instead of figuring out what is the best opportunity for every child and how do we lift those opportunities. But it's really only you know, like FDR taught us, it's only government that's gonna be able to create an infrastructure 
to solve these big problems. And I think that's part and parcel of what Biden is trying to do in these first 10 days. I, I think can, can I, and I just want to build one thing just because I want to make it concrete for our listeners because I couldn't agree more. And I'm sure Kyle would say, Kyle, you'd agree with this too. Like, I'll just give a prime example on infrastructure and what Randy's saying. The fact that we've discovered where we are as relates to digital capabilities for mm -hmm. all children, it, it's a disgrace. It's a disgrace. It's, it's embarrassing. Uh, you know, we, I was embarrassed that I did not understand where we were in my own organization. But this solution, I mean, there is an obvious uh, answer here. There is a way to close this. It's, there's federal legislation that's out there. And all of us could sit there and say, we can try to figure out a way to, to patchwork this. And it might take 50 years. While the rest of the world, you know, other countries just say, let's be obvious about like, we need a solution. This is where the world is today. Every family and child should have access to, to Wi-Fi and, and devices. Even when we go back and I this, even when we go back to brick and mortar, we shouldn't say, oh, now we don't need to worry about that. My children in my house have that. It's an assumption. And yeah. it, is, it, is, it is where we should be. So collectively, hopefully we don't miss these opportunities and hopefully with a new administration that could be part of this to say, let's close this divide now. Let's not forget what we discovered before we get back to whatever people view as normal. It's kind of like what electricity was mm -hmm. in rural areas 40 years ago, 50, 60 years ago. And, and it is an absolute essential. And, and I'm sure this is true for Kyle and you, Mark and Richard, but I often use, you know, my, my wife's a congregational rabbi and we're on Zoom all the time. We pay $250 a month, probably more now, on trying to get high-speed internet. Right. That immediately creates inequity. So it's not just the one-on-one -on -one machines that Richard was talking about. We need that E-Ray program. We need that connectivity to every house. It has to be like radio waves and electricity. That's an equity issue that government has to help solve. Well, uh, and I think you know Oh, I think we're all in. I'll just make a quick point, Mark. I think we're all in the same pot of soup. You know, when you start thinking uh, about, you know, I, I always worry. Let me back up and say I worry when during conversations like this, because frankly, we're not starting with a level table to begin with. You know, we're talking about schools that have been underfunded for generations. We're talking about teachers that have been underpaid forever. And now on top of that, we're going to need an infrastructure commitment that very much to your example, Mark, uh, of building the US highway system, that's exactly the level of, of uh, investment we're gonna need. And it's not gonna stop there. We're gonna, the schools need ongoing continuous support teachers cannot be the tech help desk for families are not trained for that and they've got their own jobs you know and so when i look at it i think uh we often as a country when there's an us and a them uh, whether it's race or it's economics we tend to not be great at solving those problems when we divide ourselves like that but this the population of uh, low-income families in public schools right now, it's, it's more than half in US public schools. And when you look at that, this not only is an unbelievably large problem, but it is going to dictate what happens to the US economy in coming years. I mean, it's going to affect, you can't build a gated community with gates high enough that you are not going to be right there in the soup with everybody else. And, and so I think the us and them, we've got to get rid of that mentality that, that you can hear, you can pick up on it in the media and you can pick up on it with thought leaders sometimes that it's about helping the quote unquote poor. And, and that's, we're way past that. This is all of us now. Right, it's, it's, it, that's such an important point, right? We're not, this is not a paternalistic, right, top-down question, right? This goes to every single person, rich and poor. It goes to anybody of any race, any gender, any orientation, any passion, right? If we're going to have a strong company, company, look, look at what I'm talking about. We're going to have a strong, a strong nation. We're going to have a strong civil society. Or if we're going to have strong companies, 
We need people who are educated and have access. Kai, I, I was just wondering, um, you're, you, one of the things that's so interesting is this need to, to constantly adapt. When you started the uh, first book, you were talking about books. That's right. Books are now not, the, not the, those physical things with paper pages that you actually turn. Like that's not really the thing. And that's been part of what we've talked about. Richard made, made the point about becoming tech support, right? Randy talked about having access to, to the internet, right? Mm -hmm. and, and you're also having to innovate because people need to have access to technology. They get access to texts, not through physical books, that's still, that's still very important, but also through electronic forms. How are you all adjusting to this new reality? Because very often, one of the things that just drives me nuts is, what, is when people characterize teachers and schools as being sort of conservative bastions of never changed thinking, which frankly, if you talk with any teacher, that's not what you come away with. No. Right? How are, how are you changing? And then, uh, Randy, let's let's talk about uh, you and, and Richard. How are you going to in a sustained way? Because when we did the poll, mm -hmm. about 71% of the people felt that technology was going to result in a sustained change. So let's talk a little bit about that. How are you changing? Well, um, I'll, I'll jump in quickly. The, um, you know, they've been predicting the death of uh, of traditional books for I don't know decades now, and and in fact, uh, you know that's hasn't happened, and it will want eventually. It, it will eventually, but there's still uh, heart and soul of a lot of what happens in education and a lot of what's needed at, in homes too. But you're right, first book has expanded uh, our our aperture dramatically especially over the last five or 10 years. And so what, what we've done is, uh, what, and what we've always been focused on is barriers to equal education for kids in need. And so uh, what we've done to make our, our, ourselves more responsive and more nimble is to build a research arm called First Book Research and Insights. Now that we have a half a million members and they're highly engaged, we're actually in a wonderful position through research and insights to reach into that field and very quickly find out what the pressure points are, what their concerns are, you know, and, and to respond to that programmatically. And so in very, very large part, we're driven programmatically by what our members, the educators and program people on the ground tell us. I'll give you a very quick example because while it all is, of course, uh, uh, COVID 24 seven, the truth is, is that educators are having to deal with and want to deal with all of the issues that are confronting their kids' lives and our lives as a nation, right? And so in the category of race and culture, uh, we ran a, a, a survey, a study uh, a, before George Floyd's murder, we ran the survey and we learned that 68% of our uh, educators said that they wanted to talk about race and inclusion. They were nervous about it. They were looking for guidance on how to do it gracefully. And, uh, and, and that they saw and they reported to us as a barrier given the stresses in the country, given what was going on. And so first book, really nimbly, I will say, turned and, and reached out and got uh, experts from the anti-racist community, you know, really leading thinkers and pulled them in. We created a webcast uh, that was like a four hour webcast and 13,000 people participated. And we created a, a downloadable free set of strategies uh, designed by people who are leading the, the field. Uh, because what we know is that it's, 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 yes, it's about technology, but yes, it's about uh, food insecurity. And we yes, have to, it's about- We have to it, walk and chew gum at the same time, right? That's right, that's right. And so we really, by designing that research arm, it has allowed us to have our finger on the pulse on a steady basis. And then we can, can you know, very quickly respond to what we're hearing. Randy, in terms of your membership's priorities, um, if, if we're going to walk and chew gum at the same time, what is the educational equivalent 
of, of that right now. If you were, take, you were going to take two very distinctly different issues that are at the top of your agenda in order to improve education here in the United States, what do you feel are the most important priorities that your membership has and that can be agreed across all states in this, in this uh, incredibly diverse country? Oh, we, we're having an audio issue. I said, um, can you hear me now? Yeah, now we can. I said, it sounds like an interview for another job. Um, there's two, there's, um, look, uh, everything about education is very much tied into economic security, health security, um, you know, how you create opportunity and justice. So it's very hard to um, pull a, a pull the justice issues, the economic issues, the education issues, the health issues. However, having said that, um, I would say that they would, um, that, that, that every single educator wants every single child, um, regardless of demography, with regardless of geography to thrive. And that means that we have to actually focus on um, kids and frankly, educators' well-being um, I think that we've learned that well-being um, is the entree point to powerful instruction. Second, we have to focus on powerful instruction in ways that really engage kids. Um, and that's why I started with science and social studies as yeah. opposed to math and English. Third, we have to give teachers the tools, the time, the trust to be able to do all that is being asked of them. And fourth, we have to have the kind of community relationships and the resources, you know, and the managerial expertise to do these things. But ultimately, if we want to get to a place where every single child can dream his or her dreams and achieve them, regardless of where they live and, you know, and, and, and um, who they are, then we're going to really have to start with well-being, a welcoming and safe environment, and then really kind of rethink what, how we engage kids and what powerful instruction looks like and, mm -hmm. and, and, um, and, and how we train teachers to do this and how we um, make sure that communities are part of it. So you have uh, well-being of all involved, yeah. right? The health, the security, the safety of all involved. You yeah. have safe environment, right? You have um, very Maslow, very, very, um, very much back to Maslow. Yeah. And then you have instruction. Yep. Solid instruction. Powerful. When I say solid and powerful instruction, you know, I as look, I start as a social studies teacher first as a lawyer before I was a social studies teacher, civic engagement. If you think about the purposes of education, um, going back, 200, 300 years, every single state constitution put public education into their constitution so that our young adults would be able to be civic participants. Mm -hmm. And so when I, so that's why when I say powerful education, we, we kind of went to education is about getting a job or being, uh, or getting ready for college. It actually historically in this country was about civitas. So that's why I'm just saying powerful education, engaging kids so that they want to be in school, whichever route they take. And so that, that's why I'm just saying not just good instruction, but powerful instruction. And then we're, we're talking about support for the teachers so that they are good instructors, so that they have an environment where they can actually educate. So they have the supplies and so on. And then the, the fourth area is sort of the, the, the whole infrastructure piece. Right. So support for the teachers, the, the human piece, and then the capital piece, the, yeah. the buildings and so on and so forth. Now, you know, Richard, for programs like this, right? Everybody wants to get into fights. That's what Twitter is about, so that everybody can get into fights. So you totally disagree with everything Randy said, right? Yeah, yeah. we because no. you and Randy, you know, you're, you're different edges of this okay. picture and you totally disagree. You're gonna argue against everything that Randy just said, right? I, I, I may disappoint Twitterverse today, but uh -oh. let, let me, let me, let me, let me, but I, but I would say like, um, 
<laughs> uh, the, you start with the question of like, what, what, what are we going to, on some level, what are we going to carry forward? There's always this question out there, like, is the world ever, you know, are we going to go back to the same? And I think, um, let me, I think we all are in the world where we can handle, as you said, chewing gum and walking at the same time. So let me say, I think for anyone who's listening, we can't wait get, to get back to school in, in the more traditional sense. We are dying to, I think everyone here is, we are, we are just cannot wait um, for the social development of our children, not just the, the um, academic development, but for the social development, for the safety of our children, for the safety and well-being, and for the academic development. We can't wait. And teachers can't wait to get back either. I think everyone, like they're, they're, they're looking at this. Mm-hmm. And the question is, are we, are we, people wanna know, is it just gonna be going back to normal? I think we learned a bunch of this. Like no one would ever wanna have this ever happen again. And yet in life, you do have learnings from experiences. So I'm gonna say a few that I think are worth sharing. One is we will, the way we've engaged with families through this um, has taught us something about um, what families want for their children and how engaged they want to be. And I think we've learned like when asked, they have a huge, huge set of uh, insights that we've not been having. And that is like the number one takeaway from what I've seen over the last year. We have families now who are engaging them on Zoom. You know, in the old days before COVID, even at KIPP, you might say, oh, we're innovative. Family nights were like, you have to physically get there. You wanna come to the open house? You wanna come to the report card night? You had to physically come to the building. Well, working families, even for, me and my family, like that's like, okay, how do I figure out my schedule? Our attendance for open house nights and report cards is through the roof because you can show up on Zoom. And when people get the technology, they're good to go. So why would we ever go back to a way of saying, we're gonna create barriers to entry for families to partner with us? Another example is families actually now have way more access and insight into their students' academic work. Like we, I don't know that we'll ever be able to go back they can see what their children are working on. The technology allows it. That is powerful from a partnership standpoint. And families every week now at KIPP across the country give us their feedback on how we're doing. How did this week go, what worked, what didn't. We have families who told us in, in a whole bunch of cities, you need to have a morning school shift and an afternoon, particularly for our younger kids. So we have morning school, we have afternoon school. We even have evening school in a lot of places now. Why? Because if you're five and six years old, we all know this, the ability to sustain your, your engagement really goes up when there's an adult around, just physically around to say, hey, what's, you know, and we did that based on family feedback. So we will never go back, I think, to the ways of partnering with families that we did before. And again, a big learning. And then I would say on technology, um, we can't wait to get back, but I think our teachers are telling us, wow, when properly equipped and properly trained, there are some things we're doing now that we did not even imagine we could do. So I'm not, I, don't, I want to avoid using names of products because I'm not, I'm not an endorser, but people are doing like kids are doing student work in the morning that teachers have full visibility to when they start class. They know exactly what the kids have been able to do, what they understood, where were their misconceptions, and they're jumping right into that. I mean, teachers love that. Again, never want to happen this again. Never want this to happen again. Can't wait to be back in person. But I think if you ask our teachers, there are a bunch of tools that have that that. Randy said this, powerful instruction. These tools enable teachers to be ever more powerful, which is what they want, when they're equipped and when you put in the professional development. So those are just a couple of things for viewers, like we can't wait to get back, but there are things we will take forward that I think are gonna be incredibly powerful for students and families. Wonderful, wonderful points. Um, we're, we're coming to the end of, of our time. I just wanted to mention a couple of things. First of all, we took uh, two additional polls and one of the polls was when students should be allowed to return uh, full-time to the classrooms. Um, there were a few people who said now unconditionally. About 32%, a third, said that teacher, when teachers and school administrators agree, it's okay. And uh, 51% uh, felt that when scientists say it's okay. It's one of those things where it, it looks to me as if there's a lot of divided opinion. And while majority uh, of the respondents talked about the science, um, there's also this human element of when people feel that, feel that they're safe. Um, the other uh, poll that I thought was, was really interesting uh, is we were talking about, given the academic, uh, the, the impact of the pandemic on teachers and education, does that mean that more funding should be allocated to, to schools? 91% uh, percent of people said yes, but 9% of the people said no. That's very, uh, that's very interesting. What you've got here is a uh, consensus 
forming around the importance of schools, but not a consensus necessarily locked in on how we address these problems. And so just talking about this, I'm so grateful, uh, Randy Weingartner, uh, Garten, uh, president of the American Federation of uh, Teachers, Kyle Zimmer, president, CEO, and founder of First Book, and Richard Barth, uh, CEO of the KIPP Foundation. You all are so, and your members and your people and your staff and your communities are so important to the nation, right? We are America, so what you are doing to solve these problems in various ways is so important. Thank you so much for sharing your work with us. We're so very grateful. Um, Randy, I'm going to give you the last, last word. You represent 1.7 million members. They are frontline workers like, and recognized in that way like never before. Could you see us out for, for this, uh, this discussion? Just let's say, I have a lot of gratitude to all of them. I have a lot of gratitude to the healthcare workers, to the EMS workers, the firefighters, the grocery store workers, um, the educators, the food service workers. Because in this pandemic, they have been the front line that has kept people safe, protected, engaged, trying to help parents, you know, um, who have now become homeschool, you know, homeschooling their kids. Mm -hmm. And so I think that in a world where we have a lot of polarization and where people are very, very, very tense because this has not yet magically gone away, like people believe American exceptionalism should have created, that we have a lot of people, ordinary people have done exceptional work in America right now. And I just want to say thank you to them, as well as thank you to all of you in terms of listening to us and have us. Let's find a way to chart a course where America can be more um, economically just, focus on opportunity, and focus on our better days ahead in a way that I hope is less polarizing. Education is really, really important as part of that. And um, I count on our folks to actually do their part as they always have to create a better America. We earn our way toward being exceptional. Uh, may we be exceptional in our conduct and, and in how we work together. Thank you all so much. Attendees, thank you so much for being part of the show. Thank you for your questions. Thank you for your answers to the Q&A. And thank you, uh, guests, for, for sharing your wisdom with us. Mm -hmm.